This episode is brought to you by Rev1. Rev1's mission is to help entrepreneurs build great companies. As you navigate the waters of business entrepreneurship, you don't have to go it alone. A strategic partnership with Rev1 connects innovators to the talent, customers, space, and funding you need when you need it. Get started with Rev1 Startup Studio by visiting Rev1Ventures.com to learn more. Again, the website is Rev1Ventures.com. Support for the 614 Startups Podcast comes from Nationwide. Nationwide's mission is to protect people, businesses, and futures with extraordinary care. To help fulfill that mission, Nationwide is looking to invest its $350 million venture capital investment fund in InsureTechs that will help them create new and exciting products and solutions to meet the needs of their customers. If you're interested in partnering with Nationwide's venture capital team, visit nationwideventures.com to learn more. Again, the website is nationwideventures.com. Nationwide is on your side. (laughs) 614 Startups Nation, welcome to another episode of the 614 Startups Podcast. My name is Elio Harmon, your host, and I have a very special guest, Dr. Tim Miller of Forge Biologics. Dr. Miller, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. All right. Love to be here. So I always like firsts. Right, and I believe that you are our first biotech founder on the show. Cool. So with the doctor in your title, we're gonna go a little bit deeper than we normally do, right? All because right. I really wanna explore this subject. It's really my first time talking about it. But before we dig in too deeply, we gotta learn about you. All so right. a bit of your personal and professional background. Sure, so um, I've been in biotech uh, for a little over 20 years, uh, going back into the late 90s where I cut my teeth up in Cleveland uh, doing biotechs and gene therapy for uh, kids with cystic fibrosis. And so I did some work in an early biotech company. Then I went back and did my PhD, you know, and uh, had been in biotech company after biotech company. And uh, for the past roughly 10 years, I've been a biotech CEO, um, both private and public companies. So have sat in all the chairs around a biotech table, working with regulators to investors, to building companies and teams. Um, it's been a fun, uh, fun background to bring in, but really what a lot of this comes back to is trying to bridge science into how we can use it to help patients, um, especially those that have no other treatment of help. All right, so your background as a clinician or as a researcher, your PhD, what area? Yeah, so I'm more on the research side, but okay. on the historically anyways, and the nice thing about it is it's the, it's the translational part, right? You're trying to take science that people have been discovering on the bench top, right, as we think about it, and moving that over into the bedside, right? So trying to translate good science into new drugs. Mm-hmm. So now why the focus on rare diseases? Were you always pulled in that direction? What, what caused you to kind of say, hey, this is where I want to spend my life's work? Yeah, so a lot of it goes back to uh, one of my early mentors, uh, Dr. Pam Davis. She was the dean of the medical school for almost 20 years. And she had studied cystic fibrosis for years, um, actually under the person who had identified the gene, some of the genes for that, co- or the gene that caused cystic fibrosis. And so, you know, as I thought about what I wanted to do with my career, it was really trying to figure out, well, rare diseases, there are over 7,000 rare diseases. 90% of them have nothing in development for them. And these are kids um, that often, they get a genetic diagnosis, they're told you know, by the doctor, the parents are told by the doctor, I'm sorry, there's nothing we can do. Enjoy the time with your child. Mm. It doesn't sound like a really promising uh, life or, you know, to have. And so you know, we wanted to try to start to bridge that you know, using gene therapy to try to help those kids with genetic disorders. Okay, so let's set the table a little bit. Um, in terms of the, you know, a case per 1,000 or whatever, mm-hmm. what is that benchmark for something to be considered a rare disease? Right, so in the United States, um, it's less than 200,000 people um, have it. In Europe, it's about 50,000. So, you know, when we think about it, one of the cases that we might talk about is one of the ones that came out of Nationwide Children's Hospital, the Zolgensma for children with spinal muscular atrophy, for, for example. That affects about one in 10,000 kids. Wow. And in your research or or just in the research literature, 
are most rare diseases connected with something that develops at birth or is it kind of something that you could potentially de develop later on in life and early detection really matters? So what are you seeing in terms of a mix? Uh, lots to unpack in that particular question. So but that's why you're right, here. So let's, let's, start, let's start a little bit on the beginning. So, you know, oftentimes um, many diseases don't present themselves until a few years after birth, but there are some that present very, very early. And we'll talk about a little bit about one of those that we're developing at Forge. Um, which is for infantile crab A disease. Uh, it's lethal, most of the kids die by the age of two or three, and uh, there's nothing really else out there for them from a genetic standpoint. And we have one of the first of, the, of its kind in the world being developed at Forage, and it's currently in clinical trials now. Okay. But you asked it, uh, another question, right? So it's more about um, you know, how do we think about that approach? How do we think about trying to find those kids that have those rare genetic disorders so we can treat them? One of the mantras that we have, I think, in gene therapy that's been really elucidated over the past several years has been the earlier that we can intervene in a genetic disease with a genetic treatment, probably the better off for those kids because the damage will have been prevented rather than trying to correct it afterwards. So, and that's where we really come back to newborn screening. Mm -hmm. All right, so newborn screening is you know, something that many rare diseases don't have. Um, and we're trying to find more and more ways um, that we get more and more rare diseases on uh, the government or even the state's list to try to find uh, to try to find kids uh, very early. Yeah, so um, we're going to do a lot of unpacking on this mm -hmm. show. We're going to have a lot of fun. Great. Um, so I want to go to the issue, like you said, the dread of parents, right? The doctor going in telling them that their beautiful baby has a very rare condition with no treatment options. A lot of those conversations, at least in developed countries, start even before you give you, you decide to have a kid, right? Some folks opt for genetic testing to look at risk mm -hmm. factors. Um, where are we as a healthcare system in really access being available to a lot of people doing some of those things, either before they decide to uh, have a kid or during pregnancy? Mm -hmm. what, what are your thoughts on that? Well. I think you highlighted one of the key questions is that a lot of times, depending on someone's background, genetic background, they know that there's risks in their family, right, for some form of genetic disease. And so oftentimes people will go and they'll try to do some form of, you know, screening ahead of time to make sure that they, they know their risk profile, right? You know, but, you know, what you're really talking about is, is access to some of these new therapies and how do people get access to that? And, you know, that's one of the reasons why we work through the clinical trials, right? So we work with hospitals, we work with the FDA, we work with regulatory agencies to undergo these, you know, investigational new trials to basically test to see if clinical, if the new drug will be safe first. Then you check in to see if it's got some efficacy. Okay, great. So um, let's say there was no way of really knowing, right? Like um, in, in terms of, of really determining what was going to happen at birth. And it comes mm -hmm. at a, as a total shock and folks are kind of thrown into this new world. Happens all the time. The promise of the work that you're doing, I want to kind of get some definitions mm -hmm. there first because, hey, you're looking for any option at that point. So what is the promise of gene therapy? What is it and how, did, how can it help uh, people in that situation? So for many of the genetic disorders that we look at, they're what we call autosomal recessive, which means that they're born with it but the, the disease is known, the gene that's causing it is known. And when you know what, the, what that disease is, you know what that gene is, you know what the target is. And so you can find ways to go in and try to fix it in some ways. And going back into probably the late 90s and early 2000s, a lot of that was, for example, we use enzyme replacement therapy. Genes make RNA, RNA makes protein. And so they know that the outcome was that this gene was defective and so the protein was gonna be defective. And so what um, people would do is they say, well, I'm going to just give you the protein, right? I'm going to give you a clotting factor. I'm going to give you an enzyme. Problem is, is that those, you have to go in for those types of injections often every week. And if you've got a, um, a disease of the uh, central nervous system, that can mean a port into the back of your head. It can mean you have to drill holes into the skull um, and have something where you might have to drive and spend a night in the hospital every week to have some form of quality of life. Mm -hmm. The promise of gene therapy comes in when we might be able to remove all of those injections and limit it down to one, right? So that alone is when you start thinking about, you know, the benefit for patients, the benefits for families, um, cost savings. You, know, you can remove a lot of those extraneous and you have the potential to reach more cells in the body in a more, not permanent, but semi-permanent fashion. 
All right, it's been a while since I've been in a biology class, mm -hmm. and I'm guessing for our audience it might have been a while for you. And if you don't do this stuff every day, you sure. use it or lose it. It's like yeah. a language, right? The language of biology. So when we're talking about a gene, mm -hmm. and you say we've identified the gene that causes this condition, give me like, uh, explain it to a five-year-old level, right? Of what is causing the disease in terms of how it expresses. Right. So, you know, what you're in many respects you're referring to is the, the patient's journey for a diagnostic odyssey. Right. So parents, sometimes a, a child will be born and something ends up going wrong. There's a cognitive delay. There's a learning delay. And so they'll end up going to their pediatrician and they'll have some probably some blood taken from the from the baby. And a lot of it's sent to a lab. And what that lab does is it tests for uh, usually you can limit it down to some idea around what the disease might be. And what they're looking at when I say gene, I mean the DNA, right? And so DNA is something that's inherited from the parents. And so the DNA is the thing that's going to be, essentially there's been a mutation, right? And that essentially causes them to have a, a genetic deficit. Mm -hmm. But genes are mutated. So I'm gonna use my YouTube university uh, to mm -hmm. ask you questions now, okay? So, but genes are mutating all the time. But there are certain mutations that result in illness, right? And right. so that's, you know, some of it is just kind of natural, life mm -hmm. being life and sure. evolution and things happening within the DNA. But then certain times there's like a breakdown, right? Like right. something that eventually causes a problem. But let me go because we live in some spooky times, right? right. So it, I, I can remember back to early conversations when they were mapping the genome and like at some point we're gonna know, and I think we do know now because everything has been mapped, but there's this fear of science, right? Of, sure. hey, are you playing with something that you're not supposed to be playing mm -hmm. with? How as a researcher are you thinking about that? And then how do you think you position a breakthrough like because the parents with the kids are not going to be the ones with the problem right, right. it's the people sure. who don't have kids that need the help that have opinions about things like that so given the climate that we live in and the research that you're doing and using terms like dna mm -hmm. what are your thoughts about how we communicate in an effective manner so that research like yours doesn't get stifled out of fear that we get the funding to it so that we could really get these breakthroughs yeah, so it's a, it's a great question, and it, it really kind of gets to one of the, the current questions of the time, which is like our, the COVID vaccine, right? So, you know, in, um, in normal times, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, a lot of these new genetic therapies have to go undergo rigorous testing, you know, lots of studies that get done in a lab um, to test the safety and to make sure that um, at the doses that you're going to give and stuff, that there's no side effects or that the side effects are very, very minimal. Um, and a lot of times we do what's called a, essentially a risk to benefit ratio, right? So if you're, we'll use the example I mentioned earlier, a, a family that was born, a, a child that had spinal muscular atrophy, that what happens for those patients is that they spend roughly 18 months on a ventilator for 16 hours a day. It's called floppy baby syndrome. You know, they have no movement, very little movement, and they end up having problems breathing and um, that develops additional complications. So. You know, they had to do a lot of studies for years, okay, to get to the point with the FDA that the FDA felt comfortable saying it was safe and that it worked. And so you go through this risk benefit, you know, around, well, there's nothing else out there that can help these patients, nothing to that level. But they were able to show that a single injection of a genetically modified virus, okay, can be used to deliver the correct version of the gene. And so a lot of gene therapy is co-opting some of nature's tools, okay, tweaking them a little bit to use them as delivery vehicles. And so these kids, okay, after a single injection, five years later now, many aspects are up, they're walking, they're talking, they're able to interact with their parents, they survived and they thrived. You know, so when we talk about the promise of gene therapy, that's a great case example of how, you know, yeah, you know what, we are doing experimental gene therapy, but you know, we have to go undergo rigorous testing to make sure that it's gonna be safe. Yeah, and it's that balance, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and as a society and as people, gaining a greater understanding of behind the scenes and what's truly happening, I think is very important. And that's why conversations like this in a setting like this are very important. We hear a company like Forge Biologics, they're doing all these cool things, but it's great to break it down to know how the technology works and then how it's coming to market. So we're gonna take a quick break. All right. And we'll be right back after a few words from our sponsor. Support for 614 Startups comes from the law firm of Dickinson Wright. 
with around 500 attorneys working from 19 offices across the U.S. and Canada. They handle all types of business transactional law, including advising privately held and venture capital-backed companies in capital raising, mergers and acquisition, and transactions involving technology, software, data, and e-commerce. Partner Alex Brown serves as outside counsel to start up companies ranging from business entity selection and formation, protection and commercialization of technology assets, conducting business online, and data security issues. For more information, visit DickinsonWright.com. Support for 614 Startups comes from Hairdrop. Never visit the beauty supply store again. Order your beauty products from the Hairdrop app and have them delivered in an hour or less. Hairdrop is like DoorDash for beauty products. Get your hair care, grooming tools, hair extensions, and more when you need them to ensure you look and feel your best at all times. Available for download from both the Apple and Google Play stores, get a beauty supply store in your pocket by visiting hairdrop.app and have your beauty delivered today. Welcome back. I'm continuing my conversation with Dr. Tim Miller of Forge Biologics. All right, so we laid the foundation. I think we're ready to get started on the company that you're building. All right. Forge Biologics. What's the value proposition? What's the problem you're looking to solve? And how do you intend to do it? <clears throat> so a little bit of the history. You know, so we started the company in the beginning of 2020. Uh, didn't anticipate a pandemic. So starting a company at the beginning of a pandemic and trying to raise money for it was certainly a new and unexpected, uh, unexpected circumstance. But, you know, so we ended up raising 40 million in, uh, in July of 2020. And there were four of us at that point. We had three founders and our first employee and a dream and a vision of building this new um, hybrid company uh, for doing both manufacturing for people that need, for patients, for clients that need access to these gene therapies and developing our own small pipeline of our own promising therapies as well. Mm -hmm. Things went so well. Um, we attracted a lot of interest. We started to build out a facility, raised another 120 million in a series B round, um, not even a year later. Today, we're upwards of over 130 employees. We've built out and executed well on all of our goals of, to provide manufacturing. And our, again, our own pipeline has grown small, but it's, uh, but it's continuing to go. Mm -hmm. So the value proposition is you know, manufacturing, and I can give you an analogy if it's helpful to talk Take about why. Take us anywhere you want to go. All right, so uh, we call this the, uh, the sneeze analogy. Okay, so if we were sitting here and I had COVID, you know, for example, and I sneezed a really good three-second wet one, right? A good one, right? Mm -hmm. Focus on you that for a second. didn't cover your mouth you or got, anything. Yeah, it's nope, droplets it. everywhere. Yeah. Okay. I'd release about 100,000 particles of virus and its potential that you, know, you might get infected. So when you think about how many sneezes it takes to treat that one baby that we were talking about, I'd have to sneeze 10 million times a day for a year straight. Okay, so that's a lot of sneezes, right? That's mm -hmm. a lot of you know, particles that you're trying to put together. When you put that into, okay, well now tell me about dosing and how you think about that from treating patients. You say, well, I would need to make, okay, that one huge bioreactor, okay, bigger than this bookcase. Okay, one of those, it takes me a month maybe to do it, another couple of months to release it. I can maybe treat 20 to 25. So when I tell you that there's you know, a thousand patients that are out there, that's a lot of bioreactors. And if, we, if the FDA approved some one of the more common dise diseases out there, hemophilia or sickle cell or uh, uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, it would soak up about half of the bioreactors on the East Coast. So there's a huge need that's out there for um, teams and facilities that can make you know, these gene therapies okay, for people that need them. So it's a manufacturing proposition in many aspects. Okay. so. Um how are you uh, thinking about the therapies that you go after? Because you, you said 7,000. Yeah. Anywhere from in the U.S. up to 200,000 people, in Europe, 50,000 people. So as you're going around and you're raising this money, the promise is that you can get to all 7,000, 7, right? That's like the, 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 the holy grail. Yep. But when you're practically building a company 
you have to start somewhere, especially when resources are limited in terms of what it's going to take to even address one condition. How do you think about that? And then what did you prioritize? Uh, many of us in the leadership team at Forge have experience actually developing therapies um, for rare disease. And so it's interesting because we sit on this kind of, we've been on the other side. You know, so when we thought about trying to bring things into our own pipeline, it was things that really had to, um, were a different approach, combination approaches that were going to be able to target um, diseases in a different way. I'll give you an example. So uh, there's a class of disorders called lysosomal storage diseases. And those kids are missing an enzyme that can't break down sugars, certain sugars. And they have uh, cognitive you know, learning deficits. Um, and oftentimes in one particular types of disease, they often go blind, right? So if I were to inject into a vein one of these gene therapies, I might be able to get to a bunch of the organs, but I might still miss the eyes. So I can solve for pieces of it, but I might not be able to get to all of that for a patient. Well, what we wanted to do at Forge was try to find more ways to solve for all of the needs that the patient's going to have from a genetic disability. And so one of the programs that we have, our lead program, is for uh, patients with Crab A disease. Now, what we do in that is we give a combination treatment. The first thing that they get is a bone marrow transplant. Okay, and that helps solve for a lot of the nervous system complications, particularly in the brain. But we also give a gene therapy approach where we inject it into a vein. That gets to the rest of the body, but peripherally into the nerves as well. And that's really what we're trying to target. So it sounds to me like um, for some of these conditions, they're so complex that even a breakthrough in treating one aspect of it doesn't always resolve the entire issue. Um, and so when you're thinking about how you prioritize what you go after is maybe is there an existing technology that uh, uh, handles one aspect of this and maybe we can support in the therapy. Am I, am I you are getting spot it? On. Yeah, no, you're getting it. You're spot on. That's, okay. That's exactly how we think about this. So All right. multiple routes of administration. Maybe I go into the spinal cord. Maybe I go into the vein. You know, maybe I go into the muscle. You know, but it's multiple routes of administration, for example. All right, so you set this up perfectly because both of those also, so for example, in Crab A disease, since there's a bone marrow transplant involved, bone marrow matching is also an issue. So these kids have like, it's already tough that they have this condition, but the treatments on both ends, you know, rare mm -hmm. in one case to find a match and very difficult, like with the research that you're doing to find the cure. So I know you were involved in raising awareness mm -hmm. for bone marrow matches. Before we continue the rest of the conversation, I wanna just touch on that because it sounds like in your world, you need partners, right? People who can come alongside with you right. and continue to, to innovate in their world so that you can be as effective as you can in your world. Why don't you talk about that? So, you know, uh, it takes a village, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, in gene therapy and biotech and in general, um, you need to work with a lot of colleagues around um, the particular aspects of how you develop, whether it's regulatory, your clinical trials, um, any preclinical development. So we're trying to forge, you know, a bunch of relationships, you know, with different groups that really help us and help them accelerate development of these really needed gene therapy programs. And you climbed a mountain or something like that? <laughs> yeah. yeah, we have a um, uh, we have a really adventurous group that's uh, that's pretty tight knit, and you know, so we'll go out and we'll do some of these, you know, we'll do Spartan races or Tough Mudders or things to build teamwork, but also to help try to spread disease awareness around this. Some of them have been um, we've climbed a few mountains, yeah. Okay, great. All right, now that we touched on that, so you you prioritize and you're focused on Crab mm -hmm. A, um, and. You know, we hear this name a lot, but we, very, we don't know very much about this process is the FDA. Right. You got to get it through the FDA. So now that you've prioritized and you're developing, right, this therapy, what does that process look like to get to like clinical trials and then go through this whole process? What does it look like internally for your company? Well, I mean, it's, it can be a years, multiple years long process. You first start with proof of concept. You know, and then you go to the agency, the FDA, and say, hey, we have this idea. We've done some work that says that it looks like it might work. You know, what you, we're proposing these about doing a clinical trial, but we're going to do this big safety study first. What do, you, what do you think? 
you know, and they'll come back and they'll give feedback, you know, but that, that right there, what I just said, can usually take upwards of two or three years. Um, a lot of these programs that we look at for developing something for those 7,000 rare diseases come out of academic institutions. Great places like Nationwide Children's Hospital, Case Western Reserve, you know, many of the researchers there have spent 15 years or more. Um, our program came out of the University of Pittsburgh. Um, so we licensed that out to help move it forward a little bit faster. But that's how we develop a lot of these, you know, um, alliances really with groups, academic institutions, other, you know, manufacturing or, or contract research organizations, things like that to really um, help accelerate. Okay. So let's say, uh, where are you in the process? Safety, can you talk about it? Like, I can talk a little bit about it. Okay, so give me just the overview where you are in the process, how soon you expect, maybe if all goes well, fingers crossed, yep. you'll be able to go to market with your first uh, well, so, treatment. Well, don't jump the gun too fast. Okay. Yeah, all right, because what you first have to do is you go through all these studies and you go to the FDA and say, can we start a clinical trial? Things have gone well, looks like it might work, looks like it's safe. Okay, they say, great, now you can test it in humans, right? So that's what a clinical trial will really start. And clinical, where were you testing it before? You were usually doing small animal studies in mice, okay. things like that, you know, mouse models of the disease. You know, but what we try to do is get to the point where we've demonstrated safety, you know, in these animals, and now we can move into humans. And so you do these clinical trials, and they come in different phases, phase one, phase two, phase three. Each one of these stages can take two or three years. So in rare disease, the path is a little bit accelerated because you can do a combined phase one, two trial. Oftentimes you're still gonna have to do a phase three, but that can take another six or seven years to get all the way through that process. And then you can file for, if things look good, it's safe, you've got your manufacturing in control. That's a big, big, big deal in gene therapy right now. Yeah, so you gotta manage that burn rate. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it might, it might right. be a while, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so, um, Let's okay. Here, here's how I want to approach the rest of this conversation because you know you have like a lot of lead time ahead of you, right? A lot of things could impact right. uh, when you ultimately go to market. Let's talk about um, accessing once you get that approval, folks who are willing to participate in clinical trials. What does that process look like? You know, because maybe it's in a very vulnerable population. Let's talk right. about some of the, the kind of the sacrifices for people who are, in, in, you know, basically willing to go through the process of tr testing, right, these new technologies that will eventually benefit us all. What does that look like when, when you're going out and you're, you're finding people for clinical trials? Yes, yeah, it's, it's tremendously difficult. You know, um, oftentimes what you work on with the FDA are what's called your enrollment criteria. You know, and so, for example, our trial is, you know, from birth to one years old. You know, so if a parent comes in and says, well, I have a 13 or 14 month old that it was diagnosed with this, this disorder, we're not going to be able to treat them right now because we haven't demonstrated that safety in that age group. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, what we try to do is we try to do, you know, some of these mountain climbs and others to help raise awareness. Or, OK, not just about the disease, but, out, but about a potential treatment. Mm -hmm. So it's a combined and we have people in the company that that's part of their role. You know, is to help spread awareness about gene therapy and about, you know, the diseases that we can target. Yeah. Well, you know, we have a platform. It's a small but growing platform. So if we can get involved and That'd spread the word, um, please, let's do that. I think this is important work that you're doing. But sometimes regulation gets in the way, mm -hmm. right? And biotech and pharma sure. regulation is ever present. I kind of got wind of something a couple years ago where people can opt in maybe a little bit easier into experimental hmm. treatments. Is that clinical trial or is that experimental after approval from the FDA? Have you, am I off base with what, you, I, you know, I don't have yeah, the, the facts on that. You might be referring to what we think of as expanded access or mm -hmm. compassionate use, right? Okay. So there are certain special circumstances where an individual in the family can apply to try to get access to one of these potentially life-saving you know, therapies, challenges that if enough data hasn't been generated there to demonstrate safety, it's going to be a little bit of a harder lift for them to try to get in. Mm -hmm. you know, but I think one of the important things, one of the messages to really focus on is that the promise of gene therapy, there's been so much success in the past six or seven years that shows that the approach that we're using looks like it's working. And it looks like it's working in many different diseases. That's what 2022 is going to look like. I think we're going to see a lot of really, really positive data coming out from many companies that say that their gene therapy has been working. All right, let's flash forward eight years and 
huge party at Forge Biologics, FDA approval, right? Now you have to go to market, right? This is what everybody's been waiting for. Mm -hmm. You've been on this rodeo before. Some of your employees have not. What gear does the company then go in, right? You're in research, you're in development, you're, you're trying to make sure that this thing's safe and it works. It works. You have approval. What does that gear look like for Forge? Well, one of the uh, special things I think about Forge's model is that we're able to manufacture all of that here in Columbus. And it's taking that from very, very early preclinical work through the clinical trials, through what can be commercial manufacturing, because that's really one of the biggest challenges in the world is being able to manufacture. You, you might show that it's working in a clinical trial, but your manufacturing has to be up to quality, okay, to be able to do it as an actual registered product. And the important thing to note is that even at that eight years from now, that might be, we hope, the state that we're in. But what we'll have probably done is manufactured other client products, okay, that have already gone through that process at our facility in, Cle in Columbus. That's a huge milestone. It's a big win for Columbus. It's a big win for those clients and those patients that are really going to need more and more of that access. All right. So you have uh, two streams of income, right? You, it sounds like you're going right. to be releasing your own treatments, yep, but you right. also can serve as a manufacturer for treatments that are ready to go to market today. Right. Very exciting stuff and a perfect time to take a pause. So I want to continue this conversation, but we'll be right back after a few words from our sponsors. All right, guys, let's all be honest with ourselves. How many times have you needed to get an oil change, clean your car, or get a tire rotation, and you've put it off for weeks on end? We're all guilty of it. My friends over at Vaunt set out to make delayed car care a thing of the past and created the most convenient and affordable way to care for your car. All you have to do is, one, book your service and desired pickup location, Two, drop your keys with a certified Vaunt driver who picks up your car for you. And three, your car will be serviced and delivered back to you within three hours. From now on, the only thing you have to worry about is where you're going and who you're going with. Look, guys, I'm telling you, this is the future. Try out Vaunt, V-O-H-N-T dot com and use promo code 614 startups for 20 percent off. Support for 614 Startups comes from Color Coded Labs. It's time for a better career in tech. Introducing Color Coded Labs, a 16 week boot camp that does more than just teach basic code. It's a program designed to help you actually get a career in tech. At Color Coded Labs, we've removed all the barriers to help you learn the skills you need to start a career you love in weeks, not years. All designed for people of color by people of color. Apply now at colorcodedlabs.com. 614 Startups thank, uh, Nation, thank you so much for sticking with me. I'm continuing my conversation with Dr. Tim Miller of Forge Biologics. All right. Great to have a successful biotech story in the city, right? You have the dry powder. What's next? Well, you know, we've hired uh, 130 people in roughly 15 months, you know, but we're looking to expand. And, you know, we have a current expansion plan, you know, where we're targeting probably over 400 employees in the next couple of years. And being the number one dedicated global producer of this particular type of genetic therapy that clients can come in and use, it's a big lift. And, uh, you know, but a lot of the team has done it before, but really our current expansion plans are, you know, building, hiring more people, finishing our build out strategy, you know, and bringing in additional people to come in and visit Columbus and, and take part in, you know, a world leader in gene therapy manufacturing. Yeah. So we, we always hear about onshore manufacturing versus mm -hmm. offshore manufacturing and the fact that uh, these treatments are going to be developed and manufactured right here in Columbus, Ohio is important. But I'm sure there's a little bit of give and take with that, right? Building all that manufacturing capacity here. So right. how did you guys think about that and ultimately make the decision? Was it like a patriotic decision that you had to make or you made some serious business considerations because there has to be a little bit of uh, give and take with this kind of decision? Well, you know, Columbus is really an area where we think of it. It's kind of hope in the heartland, mm -hmm. right? Um, you've got a great hospital. You've got Drive Capital, right? One of the, the largest, if not the largest VC in the Midwest. 
You've got a couple of other gene therapy companies that have sprung up around here. So, you know, what we're really trying to do is build the ecosystem, right? And the part of building a biotech company isn't just about what you've got, you know, in your own building, but it's the how do you support in and around the space, the city, the state. The state's been super helpful in providing support, providing help, you know, but those are some of the things that I think when we looked at why here, that was it. Okay. So huge investments here, scaling up to 400 people. It's going to be tough. The competition is heating up. Let's talk about places to work. As the leader, you have to set the tone for what it's like to work at Forge, setting the culture, right? To go from four employees mm -hmm. raising money and, and kind of scrapping to going to 150, you're doing something right. How do you keep that culture from 150 to 400? And what are some things that are important to you that you want to retain that startup spirit, that innovation, you know, uh, as you grow? You know, a lot of companies, particularly in gene therapy, talk about a patient's first approach. And, you know, we have the benefit of not only having, you know, a small pipeline because of that, you know, we have development capabilities, but it's also we get to help many, many other companies meet their demands for their patients. So it really is truly a patient's first approach because we're able to help meet some of the most key bottlenecks and break them, okay, from a manufacturing demand. Okay. Well, I mean, culturally, though, because what tends to happen is that we're ex expanding, we're expanding, in my opinion, exponentially, Columbus, Ohio. And what we're seeing a little bit in the market is a little bit of cannibalism, right? Like, I mean, you're going to have to get them from somewhere, sure. right? We have great universities in the area, but how do you become attractive, right? So how do you become an employer where people say, you know what, bigger offer over here, you know, maybe a faster rocket ship over here, <laughs> more equity over here, but I want to go work for Forge. What are some things that you're thinking about to become that attractive employer? Well, so a couple of things. We have a workforce development program um, that we're working with a number of different universities. Uh, we announced one of them with Case Western Reserve to help kind of start bringing in new students, okay, and trying to really build that ecosystem in biotech, pulling through the, the corridor, right, down the 71 corridor. You know, but it's, but it's more than that. And I'd like to think that, um, you know, due to really the successful et efforts of our marketing and communications team about getting out what exactly Forge is really trying to stand for. We're manufacturing gene therapies for life. Without these types of gene therapies, you know, um, many of these kids are really going to suffer, have the potential to suffer. And so, you know, from a cultural standpoint, people have come and bought into that mission. We're recruiting people from the coasts all over the place. And, um, I think that's what's really helping hold and, and continuing to build in our mission. Yeah, the mission matters, right? And I, I think you have one of those products where you really have the ability to change someone's life, right? Their trajectory is X. Yep. And due to an intervention that you have with them, their trajectory is Y. And there are very few companies that really offer employees that opportunity. So I think definitely mission matters for you. We, I mean, we've got a lot of great things that we offer. Unlimited PTO time, you know, great salaries and benefits. You know, I think that more and more, especially in things like Columbus, that's what you're seeing a bit become more, you know, the norm. Um, but yeah, you know, competitive benefits package, great salaries, you know, but really it, it comes back to the challenging people to rise above. Um, we try to support people for getting more education um, and helping teach them in a whole new burgeoning field. All right. Now I got to take my host hat off. I got to take my startup, uh, Columbus startup ecosystem cheerleader jersey off. And I got to put on the uh, jersey of a healthcare consumer mm -hmm. and taxpayer. Sure. Uh, all of this money gets poured into R&D, research and development. We understand we want safe drugs and it costs a lot to get safe therapies on the market. Right. But when they sometimes when they get on the market, it's out of reach, right? Or it's very expensive. How are you thinking about that? You know, uh, from a business perspective, I understand that, but also how we make these drugs and therapies accessible, not just here in the States, people all around the world that don't have the same standard of living as we do. Yeah, well, it's a, an important topic. Um, part of the nice aspect from Forge's perspective is that there are others already trying to help develop, develop that model. Mm -hmm. You know, the first gene therapy was really just approved a few years ago. And at that point, when it was approved, there was no reimbursement strategies really in place, you know, to be able to figure out how do you afford, you know, this type of approach. 
you know, and from a from a value driver, you know, remember, um, you know, some of the stories that we talk about when patients talk about their journey, you know, and without a gene therapy, they'd be going to the hospital, you know, every two weeks, they'd have to drive, they lose time, they have to pay for the hospital bills. If you can cut that by 50 to 80 percent, there's a significant savings to not just the patient, the consumer, but also to the hospital systems. But in the end, you know, we're still trying to work that out. Mm -hmm. And uh, since there's so many different ways to give a gene therapy and how to measure that it's actually working over time, you know, the field, I think, is starting to get some ideas, but still trying. Yeah. And I work, you know, in my day job on the other end of the spectrum with seniors. And, you know, it's that 5% of patients that account for like 50% of the cost. Mm -hmm. And what you're describing to me are probably kids who represent that five, right, that are uh, responsible for a majority of the costs. And if your intervention, not saying we're doing cost-benefit analysis mm -hmm. on life, but if you're thinking even of a high, quote-unquote, high price therapy that cuts down utilization of expensive interventions like hospital stays, emergency room visits, surgeries, et cetera, I think that's a trade-off that society can really contemplate yeah. and see the benefit uh, of looking at it that yeah. way. And that is the promise of gene therapy. Right, right. All right. Now, I, I want to pivot to being a, a drive capital company, right? Like you said, the biggest venture fund at this point in the Midwest. Uh, there has to be like, you know, some, some you know, benefits to working with a, a venture a company a, a firm of that size. What has been your experience so far? Well, <clears throat> Drive has been fantastic. Um, a lot of our personal experience at Forager really drives from one of the partners named Molly bonnock Dupur. Her vision was really what helped bring Forge to life and truly uh, uh, specialized in innovation. We're one of the few biotech companies in Drive's portfolio. And, you know, but it was because of her and what she really saw, okay, is the promise of gene therapy about how we wanted to build, you know, this company and really put in some of the investment. So they helped back the company very, very early. And uh, so far we're doing okay. All right, well, uh, I'm a big fan of yours now. You've convinced me, so you, you have my support and for the work at Forge. I'll let you have the last word. Is there anything that you, know, you kind of want to end this conversation on? I think that as we look out into the next 12 to 18 months you know, as a country and we come out of the pandemic, one of the best things that came out of that and there's been so many bad things but really what it brought up was the power, because in essence, the COVID vaccines are really a form of gene therapy. And it's helped bring that more into the public consciousness and the power that the science behind that can be translated quickly into medicines that can really make a difference in healthcare. I look forward to seeing more about what we can do there. Wonderful. I, it, it feels to me like we're just getting started. I agree. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us on another episode of the 614 Startups Podcast. Guys. There's a lot of innovation happening in Columbus, and I'm especially proud of the work that Forge is doing to build manufacturing in the city. And also, I think this might be an instant classic, <laughs> right? Much like Molly's uh, episode when she was on. Uh, so check out Molly's episode, and thank you so much for staying with us. Have a great night. <laughs>